Okay, so last week we talked about the, um, define the problems uh, from the discussion, like last Thursday, the lab discussion. Uh, I find that uh, we still need to <coughs> talk about more, like how do you define the needs and the wants, and also like uh, which group of people that you really are talking about uh, when you think about that design. Because uh, uh, from the lab, I found, okay, if, uh, for example, the peanut butter, that the one that received the highest likes number, um, I'll use that example, okay, so the peanut butter uh, problem or challenge. Um, so like the definition of who would encounter the same problem is like everyone who loves peanut butter. Okay, but if you really think about it, who really will think getting the peanut butter from the bottom of the jar is a problem? Or Donald Trump like, think that's a problem? He probably don't care, right? Or someone who use a servant at home, so that person probably does not care. Or anyone, so really who would care about the really take the effort to get the peanut butter from the bottom of the jar and uh, not get on the uh, hand. Personally, I care because I don't like waste, so I always try to get the last drop out. But uh, think about really, and uh, those are the people that uh, we'll talk about today. Those are the people maybe will be the group that you talk to say, okay, then if you really care about that problem, then how do you solve it? And they may give you some answers or some insights on the solution part, okay. Um, so. Once you define a problem and you find, okay, the problem is valid and you justify it, the next step will be generate concepts. So that's like before you do any detailed design, you generate what kind of solutions we may have. And to do this research, um, we don't, sometimes we may need to reinvent a wheel um, to make a breakthrough because the current solution um, has some past dependency from all the beginning. So if we don't go back to the original, to solve the problem, we cannot make uh, fundamental changes. But the sometime, but the, a lot of times, we want to uh, look at past uh, solutions and see if we can just improve on those past solutions, focusing on solving one problem from the solutions. Okay, and to do that, uh, there are different methods. For example, uh, do a um, ethnography research, or um, simply you just uh, camp out with the customers for extended time period observing and probing what they, how they use or sometimes how they misuse the product to see the problem there. And uh, they may give you some solutions. I remember one of our professors um, who retired, he used to work in the paper mill and uh, had, uh, until he went to the customer to see how they use their product, he's really amazed, like, oh, I never thought about those different ways that our customers use our product. Um, and also you can do, like, a, like a this uh, ethnography research is recommended as a very good uh, method for identifying problems and the research solutions um, because the quality and information provided will be very in-depth. <coughs> and also do some customer visits. Like um, some companies, they have um, their teams of engineers go to their customers to visit customers to ask some like open-ended questions, like how do you use it, any problems like that, okay, and um, to gain some insights from there. Uh, living the customer's experience, another method, it's basically putting yourself in the shoes of your customers and uh, use the product and see any problem you will have. Um, a good example I found is from Galit, this company. So every working day, they will have 200 employees um, ranging from different departments uh, in that company, um, come to work on shaven and go to that small test booth to use their product to shave, and they would follow like the instructions given by the technicians: what razor to use, what shaving cream to use. Um, females do the same, and they have this uh, one logo: we bleed, so you'll get a good shave at home. So they test the product, to use their product to see if there's any problem that they need to go back to improve their design, okay? And uh, after that, uh, some other, pro other, quest uh, other methods, like doing a customer focus group. In this method, you um, invite a group of uh, customers or like users of the product to the company, and uh, there will be a moderator of the group who will lead the question, like lead the, um, lead the discussion, focusing on the problems and the solutions, uh, and walk through the customers through that problem. So they do like uh, um, focused in interviews or questions 
with the customer group. Problem with this is that it's, it's hard to find a group of customers. Um, but uh, I mean, for your design project, you can probably do that. So find a group of people who really care about the problem, who use a, prob uh, who, who use a product, and uh, do some discussion. And the lead user analysis, another interesting method that people or, uh, or companies use. So they find those innovative uh, users or customers. Find out uh, when they have the problem, how do you solve them? Hey, in fact, many of those commercialized products are from um, the lead users who try to solve the problem, like the mountain bike. I know two of you in the first um, introduction, or, or maybe several of you, like to bike. And the, Many of those mountain bike designs are um, customer, like from the lead users. So when those um, when those um, people when they bike when they try to when they use their bike, they find those problems and they start to they are handy and they start to modify their bike and those become the standard design of the mountain bike. Uh, so those are different methods we can use at this stage of research. And the research is actually really important. It's, a, it's a not like a just a one step. Here we put it under um, generate concepts because that's where it's used the most. But uh, really it's a, like an um, activity that's a parallel with your entire design project. So at this stage, the, pro the, the, the purpose of design may be to validate your assumptions, validate the, the problem, um, see if I um, um, like to identify past solutions, but at other stages it may be like to uh, research your um, let me see research some of the theories you have in your solutions, research uh, even like when you design the materials, the manufacturing methods, all of those uh, come from research. Okay, so research is a really important activity that's parallel with entire from the beginning to the end of your product uh, of your project. Here I'll show you another video um, from the same person who talked about uh, the framing uh, effect uh, in doing the design brief. Um, he's a practicing design engineer, and so uh, let's see how he used some of those research methods uh, in his uh, design project from the beginning. <laughs> But in product design, gaining insight into how people use products adds your value to your designs, which makes your designs better, your portfolio better, and increases your chances of getting a job in design. So this episode is all about research. Research is a massive subject, and you can go really deep with it, much deeper than I can fit into a short YouTube video. So this is just a jumping off point. I've also put good links in the description for you to investigate. Why research? Well, we, we research, so we don't always end up designing things for ourselves. Once, Once you pass the brief, everything in product design becomes about stories. stories. Listening to people's stories, interpreting their stories, and telling your own story and a version of theirs through the products that you design. It's all about stories. But people like telling you their story. If you ask and they're not getting on with the product, they're usually only too happy to tell you about it. The design process is often split into phases. In university, this is so that you can be evaluated and scored on how well you complete each phase. And when employed as a designer, it's so that a job can be more accurately costed by apportioning time to each stage. What can happen is that the company employing you to deliver the project has an immovable deadline for product launch. Because of a big trade show, that they must be over with their new product. Otherwise, their competitors will get all their orders and it would be a disaster. As a designer, you've got a pretty good idea of how long things will take, depending on the complexity of the product. The manufacturers have told you how long they will need to create the tool. You know how much time you need for CAD and how long the prototypes will take to test. So, working backwards with an aggressive time scale, it's hard to reduce the end things like tool manufacture. It's usually the front end stuff like research that gets the squeeze, which is a real shame because what happens at the start of the project affects the outcome. Preparing a Gantt chart like this for every project helps you to not miss a deadline. That's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that research is a phase that happens at the start of the project and ends as soon as you start sketching concepts. This isn't true. Rather than look like this, your project actually looks a bit like this. The main concentration of research effort is at the start of the project. You're constantly doing research and testing throughout the project to move you forward from beginning to production. At the start of the project, research concentrates on identifying problems, 
confirming or dismissing assumptions, and then investigating theories. And then later on, research becomes more focused on problem solving, researching mechanisms, proving ideas, investigating materials, and manufacturing methods. You often see queries on design forums like Core 77 asking what is the most important skill a design should have. And lots of people will answer sketching or CAD, which are really important skills. But for me, top of the list would be listening, observing, and interpreting. For each project, once you've identified the target audience, you have to try and understand them, to walk a mile in their shoes, and as fast as time as possible. Not just their struggles, but their motivation, their desires, and their preferences. Many years ago, lots of research was put into making aids to help people experience what life was like for an elderly person or someone overweight. People made suits that were heavy or restricted your movement, glasses that limited your vision, and gloves that weakened your grip strength. It's easy to mimic many of these aids with a few simple household items and bits and pieces. But whilst these aids may help you get an insight into what life is like, they don't convey pain or what's like struggle every day, every week. If you just research for these aids, you can sell on so many elements that you can only discover simply by listening and observing, then making and repeating with your design. This is what's missing from so many student projects. Get out of the camera and collect first source data to inform your design, then go the extra mile, put prototypes that you've made into people's hands, and watch how they use them, then make further improvements, and repeat over and over. Really push it as far as you can in the time ahead. I'm as guilty of not doing this as everyone else, but I see lots of student work that I know wouldn't work well, if at all. Even if it is a beautiful CAD rendering, I can tell they haven't been searched and made and tested a physical model. Designs tell stories, and their purpose is to become real products that people use. With the pressures of making your portfolio look good, the risk is you jump to the beautiful CAD rendering without doing the hard yards. To the general public, most of them won't be able to tell the difference. But to product designers, the people who might employ you, this stuff stands out in the mile. You can tell who has really thought about the product use and who hasn't, what is impossible to manufacture, what would be uncomfortable to hold, and what wouldn't work. No one wants their products to tell this sort of story. So putting beautiful renderings of unmade and untested work in your portfolio demonstrates you can use CAD, but not much more. So get out and talk to people, starting with family and friends. A simple example of this is my nan in her kitchen. One statement that she couldn't stand for any length of time so could no longer cook safely it totally changed the way I looked at kitchens and led me to a new kitchen design that adapts to its user and is designed to be safer. Recently, I was talking to her about the TV remote control. When I was 82, I broke my wrist and fell in the middle of the hall and broke my wrist, which I didn't pass it for a while. But they didn't get the plaster on right at good at the time, and so I got pins and needles in my fingers badly, and so they had to take the plaster off early. Consequently, I can't grip anything, so when I'm wanting to do anything like that, um, this hand really is a very little use where you need two hands. With the back to the thing to go in that hand to hold it, and then if I'm shaking a bit, you need to pull the, 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 the battery cover off. The older we get, the more problems we encounter with a whole range of things. A TV can be someone's main entertainment, it's their window on the world. So, to not consider all its aspects of use means that the designer unwittingly builds in barriers to its use. This is crazy. You can't just focus on one element or the main purpose of the design. Your approach and research to identify areas to improve has to be holistic. A TV remote that you use can't change the batteries on becomes a negative experience and the loss of independence as you then have to rely on someone else's help. In the past, I have been involved in focus groups to find out how people struggle with products. Running focus groups and keeping conversations focused on the product in the right way is a skill and focus groups are a great way to identify problems and avenues to explore. But just remember, if you're sat around a table discussing a product without observing how it's used in its typical setting, you are missing out on half the story, where people score it and how they feel it. It's like taking a train ride and only looking out of one window, you're only going to see half the world. 
So I think the key is observing people using a product in that product familiar environment, thus getting much more depth by asking questions. Open questions are the who, what, where types of questions. What do you find hard about using this product? Close questions are when you want a specific answer. How often do you need to replace the batteries? There is an art to asking questions. There are many ways to ask the same question. And who you ask can affect the answer you get. I used to work in a college, and teenagers were forever coming into the office because they'd lost their timetable. All they'd say was, Oh yeah, I don't know where I need to go. The question forces the person dealing with them, me, to have to ask them more questions to be able to help. What they should have said was something like, My name is Product Tank. I've lost my timetable. Please would you tell me where Mr. D's sign is teaching him. This is giving helpful pieces of information first before asking for the answer you want. Imagine if you were asking for a job. You wouldn't just say, give me a job. You'd say, hi, I'm a credit design student. I'm good at sketching ideas. I don't mind helping around the office and I'll make a great cup of tea. Please play an intern with you. So in one sentence, you can show benefit, show benefit, and ask a question, or give, give, ask. But with research, give, give, ask can easily be a leading or loaded question. It's important that they tell you, not you tell them, the benefits and ask if they agree. I feel most people struggle to change the batteries in this device. Don't you agree? It is leading. Have you ever changed the batteries? Can you show me? How did you find that? Well, this is a much more honest response. So don't wing it. Prepare your questions. Put the product in their hands. Watch them using it. And then ask questions based on what you see. Give people enough space and time to tell you their story. For many of the problems that your research throws up, you may find yourself encountering what you feel are the same two solutions to problems over and over again. Option one, a solution to the problem already exists, just the person doesn't know about it. For example, someone I know um, was struggling to use their telephone. They didn't realise they could buy an electric house free one. Option two. The solution is more service based. A family friend struggles to chop vegetables. But rather than design a clever mechanism that makes chopping vegetables easier, she can just buy packets of pre cut vegetables. It would be easy if you come across these problems to think that there's nothing you can do. That's not true. We are the most adaptable species on the planet, but we're not going to evolve new appendages anytime soon. So what we've become amazingly adept at is creating tools. And often, when a tool creates a problem, we design another tool solution. We create a tool to help us solve the problem created by another tool. For the person struggling with their tin opener, buying an electric version is certainly the best short term But rather than what at first glance is a closed off avenue of research, the tin opener problem has opened up three avenues, improving the standard tin opener, improving the electric one, selling the batteries, and trying to redesign tin or some form of packaging. A few pointers. Make time to get out there and talk to people. It's one of the things all designers don't do enough. Don't design in isolation by just taking the brief and starting to sketch ideas. Use the insight people give you to add value to your designs. It will improve the design, which in university should get you higher marks and make your portfolio better. So increase the chances of you getting a job. Prepare so that you can get the answers you need, not the answers you want or have assumed before your research. Know when and why you're asking open and closed questions and avoid leading or loaded questions. If you observe how a product is used outside of a typical setting, we're missing out on half the story. Nothing beats watching and questioning your target audience in person in a setting they are comfortable with and a setting where the product you are redesigning is commonly used. Be prepared to change your mind. As designers, never assume other people think like you. The older I get, the more I discover people don't think like me at all. Finally, don't waste your research. Sometimes I use my knowledge of the people I have researched to add a twist to a project they are not the target market for. As an example, this is Colin. Colin's an ex-rugby player who loves all drinkings online. 
He doesn't like walking around the shops because of his hips, and he will rail against the door. And say I'm designing a coffee table, and I'm looking for inspiration. I'll use Colin or Maxine or Shirley or my man, and try and create one to their needs to see what new ideas this method could bring. So a mail order coffee table can be posted through the left box to save Colin hands from the door and constructed with no tools and limited dexterity, with a leopard skin print option. It's an interesting design challenge. Or say I'm designing a vacuum cleaner. As you know, my man can't stand for any length of time and has bad balance, so he can no longer do the vacuum. Uh oh, option one alert. Why not just get a robot vacuum cleaner? Well, I could, but it's a bit getting crumbs off the sofa, and just like here, it can't manage the stairs. It's time to get my thinking hat on. This may or may not help you, but hopefully it's good. I hope you enjoyed this episode. In the next episode, I'm going Okay, so he talked about some of those uh, methods we talked about and uh, give some examples, hope it's um, helpful. Um, once you research the past solutions and uh, identify really the problem is, then the next step, um, also like what we look at in the ideal um, um, shopping cart design project, they went to observe what the customer, how the customers use all the existing shopping carts and they went back to the, um, the workroom and they use the post-it uh, post to brainstorm as many ideas as they could, and uh, they put it everywhere, Remember, if you remember that. So that's kind of like a brainstorm solution um, session. And uh, some, here are some guidelines, general guidelines uh, for the brainstorm session. Um, no criticism is allowed during the session. Remember like uh, that uh, um, team leader um, in the ideal video, he has like a bell on his uh, wrist. Everyone who, like anything that's uh, um, not respective, he would ring the bell, uh, saying, okay, that's not good. And uh, the purpose of a brainstorm session is to generate a large quantity of ideas. Okay, so it's really, like uh, some seemingly crazy ideas are quite welcome because creativity sometimes uh, um, gets from there. And uh, when you generate ideas, um, another guideline is like, uh, everyone need to have a turn or you, end the brainstorm session until everyone talk about it and no more new ideas come out. Okay, and uh, um, all the ideas need to be kept short and snappy and you don't go into much details at this step um, because the, um, like the focus at this session is a quantity um, instead of like going really deep into those solutions. Uh, we'll go to really deep um, into the solutions in the next step. But here is try to get as many possible ideas as possible. And then when you look at others, uh, you can try to combine and improve the ideas. Um, they don't have to be like really original. And when you look through and walk through those postcards, like, oh, sorry, the, the, those post-it uh, um, notes, then you can say, okay, what are the, oh, this person had this idea, maybe I can just uh, improve on his and I get another idea. Okay, so uh, there's the optional reading again from your uh, memory jogger about uh, brainstorm sessions and then we'll probably do one on Thursday, okay. And after you generate a lot of ideas, the next step would be, oh, and during you generate the possible ideas, uh, you may find, okay, we need to maybe reframe the problems, like we mentioned last week. Um, how you frame the problem really affect your solution. So some additional design goals may emerge during your brainstorm sessions. And at every step, apply the STEM principle. <coughs> um, then, once uh, a big pool of ideas are generated, then it's time to select the approach because uh, um, we'll never end. We don't want to just end with the ideas. We want to get a solution, t get technical drawing off, and do the prototype of. And how do you select approach? Again, there are some different, uh, uh, when you select approach, it uh, represents, okay, from the brainstorming solution, what do we need to use? Like the skill, thinking skills is really diverge and create a, a big list of them. And so you just uh, come here. And then when we generate a big pool, it's time to select approach. So we need to converge and uh, make a solution, uh, make a choice among those uh, um, solution, possible solutions to get to the answer part. And uh, to do this, there are some useful tools that we can use um, called the decision matrix. Um, so here is one example. There are different methods, like 
under there's a matrix, there are different uh, ways to get those values. Again, some optional reading for you guys to read when you go home. Um, I'll introduce those two here. And um, so a digital matrix is a tool that we can use to compare those design solutions against one another. Um, anyone remember how they decide on the solution in the ideal um, shopping cart design project? What's that? They voted. Good, 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 thank you. So they vote, vote on the uh, post-it. And uh, the one who like received the most uh, votes uh, get to be explored more, right? So here, um, the, for example, if uh, six ideas are gener were generated, okay, and um, the team also, like in the design brief stage, you would uh, design, you would uh, describe the cr criteria, right? So for example, cost, complexity, development time. So those may be some criteria that we we'll need to consider to evaluate those options. Then you give some um, like a points here. For example, those ones, those one, two, three may represent the votes received from those ideas, okay? Or another way would be, um, um, let's see, I'll just, I'll just draw here. So if we use um, the nominal group diagram, the, the nominal group technique. So the nominal group technique is a, one very simple method that we can use. Um, basically, if there are one, two, three, four, five, six ideas, so every team member, so so this will be like a team. Can you see it? If I I'll, I'll switch to white. Okay. So you will have team members. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Just one to avoid confusion. And then here you can have like a, uh, here are the ideas. One. Ideas. One, two, three, four, five, six. So using this uh, nominal group technique is when you vote on very simple ideas, you don't even need to consider like those cost complexity, or you can do one matrix for each of those costs and uh, combine the grid, uh, combine the points to put here. So basically the team member will say, okay, I rank, uh, for example, option six the best. So that's my best choice. What's my second choice? Uh, maybe number three. <coughs> my third choice, my fourth choice, uh, my fifth choice, my sixth choice. Then every team member will do this ranking. So number two would say, okay, this is my first choice, um, second choice, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And the third team member do the ranking. Five, six, <coughs> uh, four, okay. We'll just assume there are three team members. And then you add up those uh, ranks together. So this one you get, uh, 13, you get uh, 15, this one is 6, this one is 5, this one is 10, this one is 14. Then which one you choose? Uh, uh, so remember those, those numbers represent the ranking, so like a fir one would be like my first choice, okay? Like a six would be my last choice. So once you aggregate the group sum, which which one will you choose? Three. Number three, right? Right. So this represents uh, the highest preference for like the, the among the group members. So this is just a very simple tool that you can use. If uh, um, one way can do it, just to do the ideas uh, as a whole, or you can say, okay, this is the matrix that we use to compare just the cost part, okay? So then, how many matrix will you have? In this case, if we want to do cost, complexity, development time together. <coughs> how many times you need to do this? Should I realize? So if we say, okay, this is the matrix that we compare ideas one, two, three, four, five, six regarding to their cost. So like, okay, um, in this case, the project team member one will say idea six has the best cost option, so it's the most cheaper, okay? And uh, um, team number two will think, okay, option three, idea three, to me, 
is the most economical way to do that. So you do this uh, evaluation, you have one matrix for each of those criteria here. So you will have uh, three matrix that will fit to this entire decision matrix. So you would put uh, the, the total, total ranks you receive here and aggregate them to find the final solution. Okay, so this is the nominal group technique. It's based on ranking. And uh, there are some other more complex. So depending on how important that the project is and how important those uh, criteria you develop is, the other two is uh, this uh, prioritization matrix. It's also introduced in this book. So in the prioritization matrix, what you do is uh, you would compare the project. So here would be um, your ideas. Ideas, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you can again do this in a group. So every person, every person will have so ideas for cost. Okay. You will have a matrix like this. And you cross the diagonal. Oh. So not this one here, here, here. Okay. And in this case, you do a pairwise comparison. Pairwise comparison means that you're going to compare, okay, um, regarding the criteria cost to me. So this is by individual, okay? To me, idea two as compared to one, say if uh, you can give it a weight, say like, like just say like a 10, 10 represents, uh, um, so, so here, I'm thinking two compared to one, two cost 10 times as uh, one cost then I would give two 10 here, and uh, one will be one tenth. So this means uh, two costs 10 times as the uh, one costs, okay? So the other way would be like uh, one cost the one tenth of two, okay? And then number three, you compare to one again. So one as compared to, three as compared to one, uh, maybe three is less expensive, um, like uh, one, just cost half of it, and here on this side, we will put a two here. So you compare every pair. And four as compared to one, this uh, is uh, maybe like the same, okay? So they cost the same. So I give one here. Four, five as compared to one here. Five as compared to one here, like two times, okay? And here will be one, half of it. Six as compared to one, so maybe that's just the, the same, same cost. So you would do this uh, in pairs for everyone. Then here you will do, okay, um, two already did that, like, okay, then three compared to two, three compared to two, we haven't done it yet, so three compared to two, we'll, we'll, we'll put all those values here on this side. Uh, not this one. Then, on. This uh, upper um, corner, it will be just the reciprocals of those values. And uh, you do this for every, um, every member does this comparison to every criteria. So every person will do three matrix. And then you aggregate those values. So the book discussed how you aggregate the book, uh, aggregate those values, so I'll ask you guys. Did anyone didn't buy the book? Or well, everyone didn't buy the book? Anyone bought the book? How many of you? Okay, okay, so maybe like do uh, share, or you can, you can just uh, Google, you can Google online, prioritization matrix. Okay, so this is just a simple um, introduction. Um, this is your assignment to go back to read about this method. So you, you guys don't have many um, assignments from the, from the class, but this is the one method that I'll ask you to go Google see how to use it, and later in your design project, um, you're going to talk about how you use those methods to make decisions, okay? So 
the purpose here is to, from all those research on the problem and the past solutions, brainstorm any new solutions, um, and we come to approach that will continue to do the system level and the detail level design. Okay. Um, so then if uh, the technology is necessary, um, or if, if the technology that's necessary to develop the solution does not exist. For example, you converge the, to this one solution that everyone thinks it's brilliant, but you find, okay, um, we don't have the skill set, or we don't have the technology, and it's uh, impossible to learn that skill set with the time um, limit, then we have to go back um, to maybe um, switch to a different uh, solution, or even redefine the problem. Okay. And um, as we said, um, some scientific research may be needed at this step um, to research for that. Then once you, then the next step, once you develop this and you decided on an approach that you're going to continue, then we're going to develop this solution. And the, the objective here is to determine the major characteristics of the solution, including like those general configurations, the functions uh, that it will, um, it will have. So it's a very, um, like you're developing it based on the design brief. In the design brief, you basically talk about, okay, um, what's the very general problem we're going to solve, some constraints, and what are our clients, who will, who will use this product. And uh, here, then, this solution will make it, like, go one step further. You're go going to determine the characteristics of the solution. So. What the functions you are going to use? Say, if, if they're going to lightweight here, they will be convenient um, and uh, um, like uh, energy efficient. All those things will add to here. And what will um, what like the appearance? Is, uh, what's the shape of it? How big it is? And uh, in this step, we're going to do analysis, experiments, uh, make some mockups. Like in those videos I showed, the people use even just like uh, papers to, to do some make mockups, like. Um, 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 cardboard to just to show some like uh, to communicate. One way is to communicate among your team members, or and to and maybe bring it to your potential users to see. Okay, is this one solution that you are thinking about, or how, how about this design? Would you like to have this one? And some layout drawings and the sketches. Okay. So this is called the system level design, and then we we'll have the detailed design. Oh. Yeah, here, we'll have the detailed design that you continue to determine the detailed characteristic of the solution, including like the final technical drawings, the prototypes, the final product, and uh, the presentation. Um, similar process will be used here. And uh, when you decide uh, the functions of your product or your design, um, usually we'll have to decide, okay, then to achieve those functions, how do we, um, what, what, like when you translate those functions to your product, what kind of uh, parameters or like the design parameter values we're going to set? Um, if uh, I know those are the functions that we're going to achieve, then how do we achieve that in terms of design? So the quality function deployment method um, here called the house of quality. Um, probably the, if you are IE, you know this, right? What about MEs? Have you ever heard about this method? No, okay, okay. So this is a pretty useful method that uh, helps the, the designers to map the functions here. So for example, um, let me use the pen. So um, here, here are those. Okay, so those ones, I'll, I'll read it if you. Like uh, low electricity requirements, aluminum components, auto focus, auto exposure, auto film advance, economic design. So these ones represent the functions that we're going to decide, uh, we're going to achieve. And, uh, and what the customers uh, will really want would be, oh, sorry, run, run place here. So we'll start from here. What the customers really want. Like uh, when we in the in the design lab, we talk about okay, you decide what the customers needs and wants. So the needs are those really basic, uh, um, basic, uh, basic uh, things that the people want. Okay, like the for example the peanut butter challenge. 
the needs is like to get the peanut butter out from the bottom. Okay, and the wants would be okay not to not not to get any peanut butter on my hands. So like the needs is really basic, and the wants is something extra. And here, um, the customers will say, okay, um, I, I I need to solve. I need to. Um, yeah, there's a problem, but uh, here are some extra um, conditions that your design need to meet. Um, need to be lightweighted, need to be easy to use, need to be reliable, uh, need to be easy to hold uh, steady, uh, no double um, exposure. And then you would, uh, and the, the customers also rated those different criteria in terms of uh, how important each of them is, okay? And then you will say, okay, to achieve the lightweight, what should we do? Maybe um, use aluminum components. That will help. So you, you think about the, what the material you have to achieve this uh, low weight. Okay, and then you would put okay aluminum components. And here um, they have a medium relationship here. Okay, and also low electricity requirement. So you don't need like a motor or anything there. So that's another um, another another design parameter that you need to include. So here we'll say, okay, the lightweight is um, highly related to low electricity requirements, and also the material used, maybe use aluminum components, that also helps improve <coughs> the lightweight function. Another one will be, okay, economical design. Um, so people, are, when, they, when, they, when they use a the product, they would feel that uh, like it, it's lightweight, or at least the, um, the way they use it will, will make it more easy. It's easier. Make them feel it's lightweight. Okay, so you put those uh, functions or the customers wants here, or the functions you want to achieve on this side, and then consider the design, the ways to design your product on this side. And uh, you can see that many of them, okay, for example, easy to use. Like this, the low electricity requirements, it will be related to several of the criteria here. So you would put the different options there and say, okay, this one is probably really important because it's highly related to three of those customer requirements. Um, though, like the rating is not really high here. Um, some other ones, for example, economical design. Um, it, ha it has a it has uh, it has uh, like a high, very high relationship with uh, easy to hold steady, okay, and uh, it also has a medium relation with uh, easy to use. Um, oh, sorry, I I, I said it wrong. Th those those dots are like a low low um, low relation. Uh, those ones with a circle with a dot. So we'll look at here. Circle with a dot represents a high relation. So this one economical design seems to be pretty important. It's uh, highly related to um, easy to hold steady. This this function, this one customer wants that ranks pretty high. Okay, and it's also related to easy to use, um, which rank the fourth. And the economic design also related to the lightweight, um, some in some way. So uh, when you design the product, this will become a very important thing that will keep in mind. And uh, um, here. On the roof of this uh, quality of house, it also represents uh, how they, like each of those uh, um, characteristics of your product is related. For example, um, autofocus, autofocus here, is related to auto exposure. Meaning that if you have um, autofocus, you probably will need to consider doing auto exposure. Okay, and. Um, um, let me ask you, what does this here mean? Can you can you tell which two are related? Which one? Okay, auto film advance right here. Like these two, these are related. So this has a quality help you de to decide which characteristics <laughs> are really important and the. De and uh, if they are dependent on each other, then if you have one of them, you probably will need to include the other one. Okay. I really cannot see the here. Okay. Okay. So I'll see you Thursday then. Uh, I'll, I'll put the assignment uh, uh, on the canvas. Okay. And some reading and some exploration.
Yeah. Mm. Okay. Oh, you didn't get a one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, are they? Oh, okay. No more. Mm. 